It's time for a panel discussion now. Gear up for the first power-packed session of the day titled Post-COVID World Exper Experiential Marketing and Kids Engagement. Let me welcome the participants. We are in conversation with Prerna Uppal, Chief Partnership Officer, Kidzania India, joined by Alamjit Singh Sekon, Commercial Director, Bell India, Ranjita Raman, CEO, Jaro Education, Tarak Bhattacharya, Executive Director, Mad Over Donuts, Vedang Jain, Director, Digital Media, Prachar Communications Private Limited, Sonia Selin Rego, Corporate Sales and Marketing Manager, West and South India, Turkish Airlines. Hi everyone, uh, I'm so privileged and I'm so honored to have you know, the leading stalwarts and it's a very, very diverse group for us today. Uh, we've got from, uh, you know, people from food, retail, FMCG, EdTech, airlines and we're waiting for somebody to come join us from the media. And uh, I'm also very happy to have the house full out here. It's a very, very happy moment and an, a very exciting moment to have people come to Kitsania and, uh, you know, with full vengeance, as Karuna said. 
and uh, we are here to talk about experiential marketing today. Uh, to start with, uh, you know, as a key uh, brand custodians out here or the brand owners out here, we are all in the business of building brands. And uh, the business of building brands happens because we treat brands as humans, right? The human connection, again, is based on different pillars. You know, there's a social connection, there's an emotional connection. And the relationship that we build with brands is set on a bedrock of experiences, right? And uh, the last two years we've seen, you know, the world come to a screeching halt. And uh, experiential marketing as a business was the only business which took a major hit. And now that we are back, uh, you know, I just want you to know uh, from all you brand owners out here, how much of the experiential marketing or, you know, how much of the experiential marketing as a platform forms as part of your overall marketing strategy? Would love to hear from all of you. Let's start with Tarak first. Hi, everybody. Good morning. <clears throat> I think to start with, uh, you're right, I think two years was tough for everybody. I think food came back with a vengeance, I think. There was too much of, you know, emotional, you know, revenge eating happening starting. Correct. I think to start with, uh, we are into food business, uh, we are into experiential business, as you said it right. I think um, food is all about happiness and, and I think happiness came back with the food in the first place and we started selling our donuts, sending our donuts, you know, giving our donuts to everybody. And that's how it all started, you know, after two years. Uh, but you're right, I think, we are into happiness business, and I think happiness is the key word for all of us together as a brand at MOD. Nice. How about you, Alamji? Thank you, Prerna, and uh, good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure and privilege being here, and especially, as you said, after two years. So, delighted to share my views and thoughts with, with everyone. So, I think experiential marketing is key. It was key during this pandemic period and stays so. The reason I say this is, let's say, so maybe specific to the business I do. So we work with uh, the Laughing Cow, which is into cheese, and uh, I can tell you my cheese is great. But for a kid to experience it or someone to experience it and say, oh yes, this is the product truth, that's going to come in only through experience. And the belief in that is going to be different than just a commercial, because that's just the brand talking, rather than an experience that's created. So I think if uh, so experiential marketing is, has been super important, it just is that this past two years made it difficult. I wouldn't say it was impossible. It was finding those ways and means. Even at that time, how could you reach out to consumers? Consumers still wanted to buy products. It's not that shopping stopped. In fact, if anything, the need was heightened because possibly the out-of-home industry at that time took a hit. And it was like a little bit of a struggle. How do you get the deliveries on? Should you get food from outside? Or should you at that time concentrate more on what's happiness cooked at home? And therefore needing more and more interesting food. So I think the key about experiential marketing is, is possibly irrelevant with respect to COVID. It just is that sometimes context is difficult. And how do you still reach out to your cons consumers, custodians? Maybe I'll give an example of something we did. So at that time, we said, consumers can't step out of shop. Can we try and take the brand to consumers, to their households? What are the ways of tying up? And we try to do some amount of sampling at directed households, maybe like sending in some cheese with the bread, maybe sending in something with the bread wallas, which is unique in Mumbai. And things like that, those worked. So I would say something that's key in a nutshell stays a key. And maybe with things opening up, just makes it easier for brands like ours to, to go out and reach to, to our consumers. Nice. Yeah. Thanks, Prerna, for inviting me here. And lovely morning to everyone. Uh, my introduction, Prerna, already gave. I am CEO of Jaro Education. So our business is to educate school children to the working professionals. So we call ourselves a company with that caters from KG to PG. And we also do... PhD programs yeah, from the global universities. So for us, uh, being an edtech, experiential learning is very, very important. 
Now, it's the era of digital learning and you need to create a different experience with everyone. Now, it's not easy when we call it experiential learning, experiential marketing. It's a very tactful stuff, yeah? And that's when a lot of strategies has to be aligned together. Uh, in today's era, if I say what is experiential learning for us is, is through you know, virtual setup. You, uh, statistics says that about 46% of children within the age group of 10 are there on social media and are YouTubers, in fact. So experiential learning for edtech is uh, very essential and that's when we invite a lot of uh, uh, influencers through influencer marketing. We create virtual reality-based learning so to ensure that student gets those experience before they get into it. And uh, uh, while I talk about experiential learning, I think I have not seen a better platform than Kidzania, yeah? And uh, it's been uh, maybe eight years as a parent that I've visited here and, and uh, I have of course taken my child around the globe in various other experiential learning set up, but I would call experience uh, at Kidzania has been the best as a parent and as a child for me. Today while I was telling my daughter that I'm moving to Kidzania for, for some work, she was so excited to come along and I said, no, it's your school, maybe we can visit some other day. So I think that's what experiential learning means when the push is not there and pull comes up. Yeah? And that's how, you know, Kidzania is one of the best examples of any experiential learning that I have come across. Though we as an edtech are also working hard to create different types of experiential learning for our children and uh, getting a lot of success in that. Thank you. Sonia. Good morning and thank you. Um, for us, experiential uh, marketing with kids uh, begin with Kidzania. Because, um, of course, we've been associated with Kidzania now uh, from 2019. And what better platform than this? Besides um, Turkish Airlines resumed flights just now, I mean, two post days. April 2nd, just about two days. And we're happy to be back. The experience, experiential marketing or uh, the experience will, will happen now. It happened in the past. It stopped and now it will happen. So for a child or for a kid, this is one platform, the first beginning platform, because they can use the simulator and enjoy and see how and what they could do. Uh, besides, yes, the whole experience of them beginning from the airport and from the start and then on board the entertainment that we have for them, the meals that we have for them, uh, the giveaway toys, which is, you know, eco-friendly toys, which, you know, is given to them. That's an entire experience. Uh, so that happens when they are on board with us. But I think uh, the first experience that they would have is definitely here at Kidzania. So we are happy and, uh, you know, it's, it's actually going to be a vengeance travel back because that's what I see. And I, when I see that, uh, when I also say that, our flights are almost on a high load factor. So we're back, we're happy to be back, and uh, it's going to be a good experience back also for the kids. Nice. Thank you so much, Sonia. <laughs> Moving on, uh, you know, we all have, you know, in, as part of your brand, uh, again, you know, strategy, experiential marketing is already there, but we also see a lot of uh, explosion of uh, new things happening in the digital uh, realm of things, you know, with the Web3 and the metaverse coming in. So how much of innovation, you know, as brand owners, are you, you know, planning towards digital versus conventional versus physical uh, platforms? Start with you. I think to start with, uh, we, have a, we have a factory up here, right here, you know, to experience the, the brand itself. Yes. So that's a starting point. I think in this digital age and after COVID where people are talking about hygiene, sanitation, etc. I think it's become very important that we do a hybrid model. So apart from Kidzania factory, we also are developing a product inside MOD where kids can actually come and experience their donut. They can top their donuts. They can, you know, make their own donuts and eat it also. Correct. So I think the starting point is that that's what we are trying to do as a part of the new portfolio, what we are trying to manage at MOD. Um, so yeah, that's it. I think uh, you're right. I think digital is the key. I think everybody is up with their computers, iPad, iPhones. And uh, kids are really exposed to everything now. 
So I think it's, and they know it all today. You cannot yes. just fool around saying that, listen, this is right and that is wrong. Yes. I think they are the starting point for us. I think they drive the parents back to the store. They are the one who will actually tell you what needs to be done. So that we have a lot of kid influencers who actually tell what to do in our products. So if it is a mango donut, it's the Christmas donuts. So we rely a lot of them into kids who tell us what needs to be done in terms of flavors. Nice. So that's how it is recently what we are doing. Nice. Alamjeet, you? I think very interesting and uh, I think each of the platforms that you mentioned, which is digital, physical, conventional, all of them have their own strengths. It's about trying to see how we can leverage them together and try and create a unified brand experience. Yes. Uh, and each of them can have a different role. I think digital has been something which is seeing an explosion. Actually an explosion because earlier we had a particular thing which is the television. Everyone had to see that one screen and one this thing. But now everyone has their own screen. They choose what content they want, when they want, how they want. And it is something that can be made super powerful too. You can have an activation that's done, have a QR code for example, which links into something more about the brand, the story. Or it could also be something more powerful. So for example, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about, I think found something I found very inspiring, which is about Castorama. So Castorama is a retailer, okay. and it's a retailer of about home goods, etc. And you might say, okay, what does something like this have to do with kids? So what they did was they created a wallpaper. And that wallpaper had, let's say, some cartoon characters. And now when you go about these characters, you just scan them on the device, and a story would pop up, which would be like a bedtime story. So it's about how you leverage a particular medium. So I think the key thing out here is that what we believe, that each of these mediums has their own role. Uh, digital is something that can allow someone to immerse more about the brand story, about a lasting engaging experience, retaining the consumer with us through, through a different period of time. A physical event cannot be so scalable. It's something that will happen at a particular point of time. So for example, when a, when a kid comes in or when a child comes into Kidzania, they'll have a beautiful, memorable experience. Now, how do you continue that journey once they go back home? Is it something that one can do through digital? And that's what we attempt to do. Uh, leave them back with something after an event, let the consumer come back, give a feedback, interact, link it with buy now. Why not? Because uh, for a consumer, they've seen everything about the brand and online shopping and, and commerce is increasing. So it, in a way, I would say it ties in seamlessly this entire digital one with the physical or on-ground events, as you might say. So that, that's my take. Thank you. Also, Alamjeet, I would like to know, you know, whenever you're planning uh, a campaign of sorts or an activation, you know, do you customize across each of these platforms or is it consistent throughout? Oh, yes, actually, uh, we do. Each of these platforms uh, offers something unique and within digital, I think the beauty is that you can even customize further. And you can say, okay, this is, for example, a consumer of cheese. This consumer of cheese is a heavy consumer of cheese who's never tried the brand. You can, what we try and do is give them a different message. This is a consumer of cheese. Okay, this consumer has tried the brand. Okay, so it's about retention. So in digital, the good part is that you can also link it, basis their purchase behavior. You can target the consumer with something which is more relevant to their life cycle within uh, the journey. Do you want to acquire that? Do you want to uh, leave that consumer with a message more about retention? So all that is possible. It just is how do you manage that data without becoming intrusive for the consumer and then leaving behind that journey. So for example, maybe once something, someone has done an activity, what we do is we'll take them to a buy now link. And then if it's the first time kind of activity, we'll give them a specific discount just to make it slightly sweeter mm -hmm. versus another time. So this is the kind of activation of things that we do. Nice. Or even take their, their feedback. Nice. Okay, what, what do you do with it? How do you like it? What do you buy now? Try, try something different. Okay, if it's some, something new, let's be launching. So all that is enabled by it. Nice. 
And also as a, sorry, uh, <laughs> a little more that I want to know from Amaljeet. You know, you're a new entrant in the Indian market as well. So how much of your content and how much of your communication has been localized or, you know, you were talking about you've created a new product also specifically for the Indian market. So how much of that customization, you know, you've uh, done in La Finca in India? So uh, maybe I'll start a little bit about the product first and then if that's okay and then sure. give an idea of how sure. we attempt to market it. So what we realized was that when it comes to cheese, it's, it's something that everyone finds delicious. But at the same time, it's not something which is a part of every household as often as, as uh, maybe we'd like. So what, what we saw was that, okay, let's try and create a new product. So we tried to create a product which was a single serve cheese. It came in a sachet to make it easier to, to use. Because typically our consumption habit is you take cheese, you grate it. Correct. Grating is not something inherent to our cuisine. So we just made it into a sachet and then it, it makes it easier to pour and spread. Now, Nobody really was talking about cheese. People thought cheese is, for example, just for a pizza or a sandwich. But at the same time, what we consume at home is maybe a roti, a paratha, maybe a dosa. A lot more and a lot more often, and no one was talking about it. So we said, let's make this product, which is, in that sense, customized to be able to spread much more easily on this bread, which is the roti, the paratha, adding the taste to it, and therefore partnering the mother in terms of being able to give something nutritious and delicious to the, to the kids. And that's how the product was also like this, the communication was also around it. And then all about the ease of usage, all about how this can create something nutritious. So the communication was not something that we had globally. It was true to the global codes because the laughing cow is about laughter. The world is not, uh, as is, is too serious. And then, uh, what we did was the Laughing Cow is always about a delicious and nutritious experience. So that's all that we borrowed globally from. So sticking true to those codes, tried and did it with a local activation, a local thing about a roti paratha in different languages. So for example, when the content is in uh, Karnataka, it will be in Kannada. Or uh, depending upon the consumer, it could be English, Marathi, Hindi. So that, that's another thing that digital allows you to do. Nice. Thank you so much. Ranjita, on to you. So, Prerna, you started talking about innovation. So, innovation used to be looked from a competitive strategy perspective in past, which has become minimum for survival. Yeah, And without innovation, survival of the companies are going to be difficult yeah? in, in this era, which is digital. Everything is accessible to everyone. While I come back to create a, a, a digital learning experience and how do we reach out, what are the competitive strategy, also, uh, the marketing strategies as you, you are more trying to focus upon. I think for us, we create that experiential learning platform. Uh, we provide you know, free downloads to students so they can come. We also ensure that uh, we have paced based learning methods, which means that it should pace up as per the need and desire of the student. And we also provide a lot of freebies. Uh, we ensure that we give them badges to make them excited and engaged all through their learnings, which is very important when it comes to kids. Learning experience uh, also create a lot of virtual reality based learning in, in academics, which is going to be uh, is new innovation now. But I think we're working continuously towards it. And uh, that's what the strategy that we've used for now, and we see that it is working out well. Uh, Children nowadays are glued to technology, yeah? and uh, that's when uh, the advantage is for everybody is to use that technology-based marketing. And, uh, and that's what is going to create a competitive advantage in marketing for everyone. Nice. Any question? Hi, Vedang. Good to have you on the platform. First of all, uh, apologies to everyone for being late and thank you so much to my fellow panel members for being patient for me. But yes, hello, how are you doing? I'm good, how are you? All good, thank cool. you. So Vedang, this is specifically for you, you know, uh, as a media uh, you know, custodian for different brands that mm -hmm. you cater to, you know, uh, when brands reach out to you, you know, how do you differentiate between offline and online marketing mm -hmm. for each of the brands? And, you know, when it comes to uh, creating engagement with the target audiences, how do you evaluate that balance? 
So I feel like one common uh, misunderstanding which everyone has, you know, these days is that because everything is going digital, you have to differentiate between which brand should you have a digital activity for, which brand should you have an offline activity for. But if there's anything that these past two years is showing us, it's kind of the marriage between the two, right? It's the marriage between the digital activity that you do, it's the marriage between the offline activity you do. Take Kidzania for example, right? Like we're here in kind of like an offline marketing activity, but yet we are hosting an event which is being broadcasted digitally. Nice. So it's about finding a, that sweet spot where we can marry both of them. And when we talk about interactivity, when we talk about engaging content, right, for your target audience, especially when I speak about kids, there's shows on Netflix like Bandersnatch, which we must have seen where it's an interactive show where each step of the movie or each step of the show, you choose the narrative. There's a trivia show on Netflix as well in which you choose how you go ahead. So I feel that is somewhere that I find the future where not only the, do the children choose the option of going ahead, but at the end of the content piece, Maybe there's something that's told to them like, you know, go outside and experience this topic that you, were learned, that you learned today. Mm -hmm. So kind of again, just bringing that digital and outdoor together because... A hybrid model. A hybrid model. Because especially for me as well, you know, I grew up playing outside on the field. So when I see my nephew or I see like, you know, my Bhavi's son just sitting in front of the iPad all day, I'm just like, I wish there was something the professor or someone over there is telling them that based on what you learned today, go outside and experience it and we'll discuss that same topic again tomorrow. Because now not only has the, children, has the child learned in the digital aspect, but they've gone and experienced it. They've done, either they've come to, you know, over here and they've come to the burger factory and learned how to make a burger, or what exactly is the topping that's going in their food, something along the lines of that. And that also serves the purpose of the brand in terms of creating content. Exactly. You know, uh, people see us as an activation platform, which we are mm -hmm. not. And, uh, you know, we like to call ourselves as an offline content create, creation platform. Right. There's so much that can be, you know, and you're having first-hand experiences and you're having first-hand reactions to the touch or the engagement that you're having with the brand today. So, uh, you know, uh, and that's kind of a misconception that needs to be kind of, you know, diminished. Yeah. And uh, I think you, you know, uh, as a catalyst <laughs> would would be a good help in doing that with you know many brand owners hopefully hopefully that's the goal <laughs> cool oh uh, Tarek to you what are the challenges today uh, you know when you have to connect with audiences I think to start with um, we still are at a distant um, kids are not being still allowed at many places to start with I think uh, that notion will go it will take a little bit time I understand <clears throat> but we as a brand, I think we follow the maximum protocols. So that is why I think our brand get endorsed from time to time. And we have seen the brands which uh, has persuaded to tell people about, not about the food that time, about the hygiene, the sanitation, the protocols, what has been laid down by time to time from the WHO or by the government of India or by the government of the state. So I think those are the brands which prevailed. They stayed back, you know, and they are flourishing today. To start with that, I think it will take a little bit time for people to come back to the stores. Um, and I, I, I'm thinking it is another six months time, you know, six to eight, nine months time where people will come back. Uh, people means the kids will come back and so by the parents will come back. And the kids being, again, I'm saying the same thing, that the kid being the influencer, they influence the parent to buy our product. I think uh, maybe a little bit time here and there, but... Uh, We'll be here to stay, I know for sure, as a brand. We're sure to. <laughs> <laughs> we all love Man yeah. <laughs> yeah, so 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 that's what I have to say. Uh, it will take a little bit time, uh, but it will definitely be on. We'll be back to normalcy, I think, I'm sure. Nice. Cool. Thank you. Amal, to you. Well, pretty interesting because uh, I think the last couple of years have been, as you said, a time when... Uh, people have been a little bit hesitant to interact with someone else uh, who you don't know. And especially the world has been a world with the mask. And I think that's also one of the uh, things which still stays a challenge. So while the fear may have gone away, like for some people, they'll still want to, so for example, tasting is believing, right, it, when it comes to food. Now can we have that level of interaction still with a consumer, still with a kid? Maybe not. Maybe it'll take a few more weeks, a few more months before this stabilizes. Where do we, in that sense, uh, meet these consumers? 
I think that itself was a little bit more challenging in terms of, for example, the in-store that was spoken of by Tarak. This was a little bit low. Another part used to be in school, because school used to be another place where a lot of activation could yes. be done, and schools were online. So now with the resumption of it, I think it's, it's going to be a lot, lot easier to reach out to children. Uh, of course, all of this has to be done in the right manner with the right level of hygiene and safety. And I think it's, it's, it's not even now, even earlier, like we talk about sanitizers, et cetera, but whenever any of our brand ambassadors would have a conversation with a consumer, a sanitizer, uh, a tissue, et cetera, everything used to be part of the standard protocol even, for, even three years back when we launched. So I think it just is about doing the basics, doing the right things, trying to find innovative ways of, of going out, uh, thinking a little bit beyond conventional. Like you said, I think consumers are back now, Kidzania is a wonderful place, and not only about creating a, a memorable experience, but for them to share further. And because we can reach X number of people, but when those, those kids or those consumers post online, it's reaching out to their network. And how do we induce that? I think it's about the challenge exists, but how do you surmount it by still creating that scale? So scale is, I would say, more the challenge today. And how do you surmount it through, through these things or innovative means? Got it. Ranjita, how about your challenges? Challenges for us are uh, very common and every parents would be able to relate to that. For us to retain students on uh, learners on our platform, because there are a lot of competition, people flip from one to another. The another which is very important is to improve the attention span. And a uh, survey says that after every 12 minutes, children lose their attention from studies, which is online studies, yes. different from classroom, yes. of course. And that's when it is challenging for all the edtech players and, and learning content players to ensure they come up with innovative methods, innovative technologies. Like I said earlier, that virtual reality is playing a vital role and that has improved the attention span. Bringing some quality content and not repeating it always. Uh, thinking of some new ideas and innovative ways of retaining them on the platform. I think this is what is next for all of us and we are working towards it. And uh, also to ensure that students should bring a balance. Digital learning sometimes also brings a lot of difficulties like insomnia, uh, uh, not being uh, attentive to all other things other than studies, not be playful. I think these are also some of the different types of challenges which we are trying to address through the digital learning and bring more engagement to higher attention span on our, on our platforms. How about, you know, now that the schools will be opening, you know, does that impact your business in any way? Honestly, no, because we have never been able to replace school and EdTech would not be able to replace school. Uh, our job is to supplement schools, yeah, school learnings. Uh, so uh, it, is, it is helpful for especially the children which are into the remote cities to not have access to the quality content, a high level of faculty, teachers, and I think this, has, this will grow further and uh, I, we don't think that school opening is going to be impacting this anymore. Sonia, for you, uh, you know, uh, you're in a service industry. What are the challenges that you face when you have to create engagement with your audiences? You know, your industry thrives on, uh, you know, personal connections. So for the very fact that uh, we started flying back, you know, that was a big thing because it was after two years. So it's revenge travel, uh, which is kind of uh, taking it's off cool, right? as, a, as you know, when we were in the conversation and that's what I, uh, I did mention to you. So it's not really uh, challenging in those terms, but the challenge came in uh, when everyone had to wait for the borders to open up, you know, respective countries and the rules and regulations and uh, what about the vaccination certificates, etc. So that's where the challenges were, but now, uh, most of the borders have opened up. Turkey opened up, of course, uh, last year itself. So uh, travel was uh, easy. I mean, uh, we didn't have a flights from India, but yet we had a lot of passengers flying to India, uh, flying to Turkey, uh, because Turkey opened up uh, then. So uh, really, the only challenge I think that we faced here was we were waiting for a flight to you know, restart. And uh, once it started, yes. Uh, Turkey opened up as a destination, so passengers were already flying, and uh, that was good. 
And um, it's, it's like people were just waiting to travel back. So for us, for me, from an airline point of view, I mean, we didn't have that many challenges, but just to wait for the flights to start. You know? Yeah, we all have been yeah. waiting for the borders to open up yes, and you know, go yes. back to having our vacations. And Absolutely, <laughs> those were the main challenges. And exactly. of course, the rules and regulations which had to be mm -hmm. uh, followed. Mm -hmm. And when you have kids, you know, traveling uh, as family. It's an ordeal. Yes, so then of course, um, you know, in India, we don't have vaccination uh, for the 18. Correct. Which has just started now. Mm -hmm. So then what kind of, uh, uh, you know, uh, people, how many children have been vaccinated at that? So those were the only concerns, but otherwise, uh, nothing. I mean, it is good. Thank you so much. Yeah. Vedang, for you, you know, do brands come to you with this set of, you know, pre-notioned, uh, you know, things that they want to do? And what are the challenges that you face? You know, I'll just give you an example, uh, you know, in with few food brands, you know, they've signed up a food pledge where they don't market to the children globally. So, you know, do you have those things coming from brands saying that, you know, okay, this is not my platform, or, you know, I want to do it in a specific way. What are the challenges that you face from your, uh, you know? Uh, of, yeah, of course, you know, that's always a challenge, you know, it's about meeting your clients' expectations and, you know, helping them understand what works better for the platform. So I feel like over there, there needs to be kind of that tri-party understanding between the platform they want to advertise on and what is the product that they're trying to advertise. Because in between all of this, it's, it's important not to forget that you're advertising to kids, right? You're at the end of the day reaching out to children who are very impressionable, but it's a different way of reaching out to them. Take a food brand, for example, that you're saying doing a charity or saying something that, okay, we are pledging to give away a certain amount of our money towards ch like hungry children works amazing for the parents, right? Because the parents are now believing in that brand and are saying that this brand stands for something good. But what about the child? Because the child is not understanding that aspect yet. For them, I will say an integration in a show will work much better than something like this. It's not mutually exclusive, right? Both of them can work in tandem together. But for instance, we have like the mighty little beam having a tetra pack of fruity or maybe having some cheese on his bread in the beginning of the show. That gets the kid excited. That's that inquisitiveness that we want in the children asking that, what is that cheese? What is that drink that he's drinking that suddenly gave him superpowers, suddenly gave him that energy? Because as growing up, all of us wanted to be Popeye, right? Everyone wanted to have that spinach and feel like, yeah, I finally have the muscle. So I feel like at that moment, if a, pro a spinach brand probably advertised during the show, they could have grown a lot more right now. So I feel that is the way right now where you have to understand what the what the brand really wants. It's the mileage and it's reaching out to their target audience. And it's just understanding which platform will work better for them. Cool. Let's talk about the trends. What, according to you, uh, would be the next five year or, you know, or there's, or there's one trend which is here to stay. You know, what, according to you, would be that? Alamjeet, we'll start with you. I think the biggest one that I see is uh, maybe the I don't find the right word for it, but maybe like the omni-channel kind of journey that we say in retail in, uh, in experiential. So how do you find that uh, equivalent? And especially as people spend more and more time on their devices, I keep getting an alert for myself like, okay, on a Monday saying, okay, this is how my screen time was. Yes. And uh, I think this entire thing on, on omni, uh, using digital better, using it to integrate more uh, and amplify, yes. I would say, uh, on uh, an offline or a physical journey. I think that that's one. I think the second thing that's there is how do brands uh, be more responsible? And this responsible aspect is going to be more and more important. It's about, I think, what was spoken earlier about, for example, the environment, about causes, about what you care, and at the same time being responsible about what you tell a child. Maybe if I go to, to a kid and say, okay, you know, this is something as, as fast food, will the world and society around appreciate it? No, maybe you'll get more flack around it as time goes by. But at the same time, if you speak about it in terms of saying, okay, you know, you can earn this by going out and, um, uh, I don't know, encouraging physical activity, that's a very different take on it. So I think it's about being responsible in how you communicate, 
and uh, moving in, moving away from standard broadcast kind of uh, messages to involving and, 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 and doing something that improves life, improves society, improves the environment, I would say. Ranjita? Next five years are going to be very, very exciting and challenging for us. Uh, a report says that uh, EdTech is going to contribute, which is for uh, school education and not higher education, 2.9 trillion to the Indian economy, which itself by 2025, which means it is going to grow multifolds. And that brings in an excitement for a lot, a lot of EdTech players to get into that market, start. And bringing those responsible content, as you said, is to ensure that what has to be, what not has to be given to the child, it has to be age appropriate, it has to be engaging to the extent that they are not deviated. It, it should also ensure the mental and physical health of the children with the help of content and ensure they are, they are groomed in all the aspects and not just into you know, learning and education and academics. Nowadays, we see a lot of new entrants which no, so at the age of eight, eight, eight and ten, children have started learning coding, and ch children have started learning, you know, different new articles, which is very, very important. And I think next five years is going to be when the childrens will be taught on technology, entrepreneurship, uh, future business, and many more. So I see this to be a very, very bright and. Uh, the setup that you've created here is also going to be very great for the children to come and experience and know that what they want to be in future. And um, I think experiential learning is going to take the front seat now. Yes. Thank you. Tarek? So for us, last two years has given uh, when completely strata is the delivery business. I think uh, suddenly our contribution to the business has become 30% of delivery. So I think we reached many more people. I think that's the future I'm talking about. Okay, delivery is here to stay. People are asking more delivery. They're into their app all the time. Swiggy and Zomato being a great contributor to the whole business arena for all of us in food. I think that is going to stay. Um, and that could be big in the future. Although they, they, they are more of a digital landlord for us. I, we put them because yes. they charge a lot of money from us. <laughs> so, but, uh, but still, I think they are here to stay. Uh, and the business will only grow from there because the delivery is becoming a big part of the whole business cycle for all of us yes. as a business. Yes. Are you also planning to start your own delivery uh, extension so uh, and not rely totally on, you know, the food landlords that you talked about? Yeah, so I think um, uh, we are doing that exercise. I think that's the future I'm talking about, which I don't want to proclaim because sure. it's a difficult business. Yes. Delivery is a difficult business yes. because uh, there are people which is required, there are trained people which is required, there are delivery cycles, bikes, uh, all accesses are required, which we are not equipped at this point of time as a brand and many brands are like that. So that is why we, we are actually depend on the aggregators right now. But yes, that, that is also one of the future content I'm talking about. Yeah. Thank you so much. Eric? So the future, if I look at it, you know, as like she said, edu ed, ed tech is a big thing and experiential learning is a big thing. And when I look at it from a marketing standpoint, right, <clears throat> how are brands going to come in this ed tech platform or in these experiential learning places? So of course the experiential learning places sure you can tie up with a particular brand for maybe a store or maybe a bank that they are going to work at. But in ed tech as well, right, when we are seeing maybe a professor or maybe five years down the line we see an avatar which is teaching children and not just a real life professor, we can have the avatar say something as simple as pick up your particular brand, XYZ brand spend and write this equation down. It's simple because this can constantly change through machine learning and this can constantly change through AI. We can change the brand name. We can have like a year long sponsorship or something like that. And again, like you said, activations in school as well, right? Because now the schools are also being supplied by that brand. So it's like a two pronged approach in how you're reaching out to the children, how you're marketing to them five years down the line. Nice, thank you. Sonia, how about you? trends in airlines, uh, especially when it comes to marketing and experiential marketing. Any thought from your side? I mean, of course, as they've all said it, it's going to be a, a boom for them. But yet, having said that, everything needs to be, you know, in line or with, the, uh, with the kids who are using that platform. So uh, that's about it. I mean, there's nothing from, from an airline point of view, of course. There's nothing, but yes, it has to take. be more. Sorry? I say your personal take. 
Your personal take on the trends? Um, I, I think it should be more uh, kid centric. Got it. You know, that's more important. It's not that um, the kids should um, kind of market for uh, an adult. It should be very much uh, for them. So I think uh, also uh, that they could look at is, is you know, um, something good for them, for the kids, like financial planning. Like how can I find, how can they, the, um, the monies, the pocket monies that they get, how can they use that as financial planning? So all these kind of way where they are involved, you know, that needs to be uh, focused on rather than um, something else. I mean, of course, that's going to grow. You can't take away from them. But what is uh, there on the platform should be uh, really uh, guarded and guided. That's more important. So we're talking about uh, mindfulness. We're talking about being yes. responsible. As yes, yes, yes. So exactly. Right? So that's yeah. very important because yes. having they, a purpose. Yes, the, it's like uh, it's they are there all the time. They know everything. I mean, how much are we going to, how much a parent is going to be really looking around and seeing what their kids are, you know, into. However, whatever locks have been put into, they know how to open up the locks. Yes. So it's like whatever platform they use, it has to be good for them. That's important. And I think that, uh, you know, any form of marketing that is done, I feel it should be more of kid centric. How they could, you know, l learn what could benefit them. Okay, as I said, fin financial planning. I mean, they should do something which they would use for their own education. When you say about pester, uh, you power. know, power, I think they should pester their parents to give them more pocket money so that they could, uh, you save know, for save it for their few own future rather than doing that pester power and you know saying that I want this toy, I want this burger or anything for that matter. You know that can be used uh, you know in this in sense. More mindful manner. Yes exactly that's what I feel gotcha. and this next five years of course it's going to always the graph is going to go up there's no stop because uh, but then you know in all this medium I think this is something which yeah, is very important. Keeping the reality in check, we don't even know what next five years would be like, you know, and this is something that we've learned uh, in the last couple of years. <laughs> Could I add something maybe? Uh, sure. So I think maybe just, just building on, on what was said, a couple of things very interesting. So one is f the future is going to be about brands which have a purpose, yes. not just brands which want to sell more and more of their product or service. And the second thing I see is uh, a little bit more about this, uh, and while it's very difficult to predict, but maybe this, this thing about virtual reality. Yes. And how do you use that to create a more memorable experience? Yes. And that, that's something that can also uh, take that experience to different places, make it more scalable. And uh, I think could be, could be very powerful. Totally agree with you. Thank you so much. Uh, Thank you. My panel, uh, you know, we are just in time and I'm happy that we've, you know, kind of finished this in time. Thank you so much.